I'm Mark Twight, and at Jim Jones, we train top-tier athletes, we train military, and we have a reputation for training the occasional Spartan and superhero. In this episode, we're going to talk about training with purpose. Working towards a goal will make the work more effective, and you'll progress more rapidly when you do have a goal. In this series of videos, I'm going to share some of the fundamental training concepts that we use, and these are things that you can apply in your daily life and not exclusively to exercise. First, let's take a quick look at the training we did for 300 and 300 Rise of an Empire. In each case, we designed the training to achieve specific goals. My brothers, steady your heart. Look deep into your souls, for your metal is to be tested this day. At Jim Jones, we've reached the conclusion that no matter how seductive the complicated things are, simple is best. That's true for exercise, that's true for diet, and above all, it's true for how we think about those two concepts. So the sooner we get over the hype, the sooner we settle down to the fundamentals and accept that there are no shortcuts, the easier it will be to actually change our current condition. What I want to illustrate here is that there's no magic in any movement, no magic in a specific tool or a certain diet. The magic comes from actually changing your behavior. If you don't change bad habits, if you don't replace them with good ones, and that doesn't happen overnight, then nothing you can add to those habits will change anything. As we have been able to understand the differing objectives of the different individuals we train, we have a lot of different options to apply to each individual. When a movie like this comes out or sports performances like you might see in the Olympics happen, it's a double-edged sword. One side of that, automatically you disconnect from it and go, I could never do that. I love watching it, but I could never do it. But then I look at some of the guys on screen for the 300 movie and I go, Oh my God, that's a human being who put himself into that condition. And the easy way out is to say that's impossible. And the harder thing, but the more productive thing, is to send a message or to broadcast a message that says, look, these things are achievable, even if not tomorrow. But okay, it might take a year, it might take two years, but you can get there. And that's, for me, the biggest motivating factor for movies like this. And that's really the point of training, is, is progressing it to greater levels of difficulty in order to change us internally as well as externally. On the original 300, we approached the training in a sort of a one-size-fits-all way. But we did very little adaptation according to individual ability. And on the second one, we adapted loads and exercises and movements to the individuals in order to actually produce a better result for that individual. The original 300 workout was actually a test that we designed during the preparation period for the first movie. And Ellie's gonna take the 300 test, which is the test that we imposed on several of the stunt crew and one of the actors on the original 300. He hasn't practiced for it, he hasn't seen it, so the conditions are exactly the same as they were on the original project. There's no machines, it's all you know weights that you pick up or just moving your own body. The reason I came up with it is I wanted a rite of passage that was similar to sort of, the, you know, a boy growing into a man in sort of the Spartan mythology, if you will. We also wanted to make sure that they were physically prepared. So if it took four weeks of training, five weeks of training, or six weeks of training before they were ready to confront that test, that's what we did. test is something that you are not necessarily prepared for. You can physically do it, you might mentally be able to do it, but it should come as a surprise. When you do a hard workout, try to strategize the little cues of how to pace the workout. As soon as it got dark, that's when my mind started to negotiate. Everything started to become dark. At that time, that's when you have to control and silence the mind and relax. And that's why it's good to have a coach or a trainer by your side, to have that little voice to help you. Okay, keep going, keep going, keep going. Goals are important to causing change in yourself. If you don't have a goal, then it's going to be important to establish one and then work to achieve it. In the next video, we'll teach some of the fundamental exercises so that you know how to do them safely and properly.
last episode, we showed you the 300 test. Now, not everyone took the 300 test on the original project, and you might not be ready for it either. In this episode, we're gonna talk about training and progression, which is something that's constant in our gym, and it's something that you should maintain in your training as well. So now we're gonna demonstrate some of the fundamental movements, and these are building blocks to more complex movements, and also stepping stones for you to take on the way to your own goals. Everything we teach is simple. The movements and the dietary rules become more or less effective according to your commitment. And that's what this really comes down to. It's you and what you're willing to do in order to achieve your goals. So to understand and map out the process of reaching those goals, we always begin by defining the objective. The more accurate the definition, the more precisely we can plan. In the context of a movie project, although it actually applies to everything, by defining the outcome from an aesthetic and a functional point of view, we begin to understand how each individual must prepare. Therefore, to me, when someone says functional fitness, I think that means it's the mental and physical condition that allows the trainee to achieve the objective. It means that the training methods we use and the lessons that we teach must be transferable to the actual task. And Ellie and Haley are gonna help me demonstrate the proper techniques for some of these very effective exercises that will help you build a better foundation of fitness. The squat is a fundamental movement. It's something we learned to do when we were kids and I like to treat it as play. It's, a, it's the basis for other weighted movements that we'll need to do as the program develops. In order to, to find the proper position, I like to jump up and down so that my feet, when I land, are roughly shoulder width apart. Toes can be pointed slightly out, but not more than 30 degrees. And then I'm going to just drop to the ground using my arms as a counterbalance to keep myself from falling over backwards. And the most important thing here is going to be depth. So I wanna see hips all the way down to below knee level before coming all the way back up to full extension. That means your thighs are you know, parallel to the floor or below. Do a few. And you can see here that in Ellie's position, his hips are well below the knee, but he's not collapsed onto his calves. So for the squat, your weight should be on your heels or to the midfoot, but never on the toe. In order to execute the squat, you're just gonna think hips back, hips back, hips back, and arms go out to counterbalance. One thing to think about here will be to keep your torso as upright as possible so that you're not folding forwards, but staying here by engaging the core musculature and keeping your eyes on, the, on a horizon line, even if you have to imagine it. This is the bear crawl. It's a nice whole body movement, and it's something that we all learned when we were kids. So this movement should take us back to a time when exercise was play. One natural tendency with the bear crawl would be to do the movement with your hips higher in the air to reduce the stress on your core. So if you find yourself with your hips up in the air like an Ellie here, the corrective procedure will be to lower the hips into this position in order to increase the stress and make the movement more effective. The goal of the broad jump is to cover the maximum horizontal distance possible. It's a, it's a hip-driven movement, so it's gonna start with a counter movement of the hips and the arms, and once you cock that spring, you release and fire to cover that distance. The, the distance that you can cover completely depends on how you cock the spring with that counter movement and then launch. So the continuous broad jump is more of a cardiovascular effort, and the point here is gonna be to string together as many jumps as possible in order to increase oxygen debt. When we lunge, I like to do walking lunges because uh, it's a bit more difficult. It requires more balance, but I also think it's uh, more transferable, so it feels has a more natural feel to it. To lunge, you're gonna simply take a, a, a longish stride forward drop straight down until the trailing knee is gently touching the, the floor. This knee should not pass in front of the toes here. Arms are where you want them for balance. Your torso is upright to feel a good stretch here. Stand, balance, and then move on. These can be strung together in a fluid way, but you can pause if you need to to adjust your balance. Keep your eyes on the horizon in front. Stand. 
drop until it just gently kisses the ground, but without resting that knee on the ground. And come all the way up and balance. So with the lunge, it's important to remember a couple of details. The trailing knee is going to be lowered to the floor until it gently touches before coming back up. Then the knee on the leading leg is not gonna pass in front of the toes in the front. That's important, the shin should be vertical. Finally, keep your torso as upright as possible. You should feel a stretch here in the hip of the trailing leg before you stand, balance, and move on. Different individuals are gonna take different length strides, and whether you take a long stride or a short one, it doesn't matter as long as you maintain the proper form. So the trailing knee should stay, just gently kiss the ground. The leading knee should not pass in front of the toes. That lead, the shin of the leading leg should be more or less vertical. The torso should stay as upright as can be to get a stretch in the hip of the trailing leg. The lunge, it targets different musculature than, say, the squat does. It requires more balance, especially in its walking variant, and it's more natural locomotive-wise, making it more transferable to walking and running. So that's all for now. In the next episode, we'll continue learning more movements. Welcome back. In the previous episode, we learned some movements, but we've got a few more to take care of, so let's get right to it. Of the body weight exercises, a push-up is the pressing motion. It's something that's concentrated on the upper body. There are all kinds of plank variations that you can do involving movement, but the push-up is a measure of upper body strength endurance. So full range of motion means all the way down until the chest touches the floor and coming all the way back up until the elbows lock out and the shoulders are in a fully activated position. So you're starting from the plank, lowering to a bridge between your chest and your toes, and then coming back up into a full plank position. I think proper form is essential because not only does it help you get the most out of the movement, but also it helps to avoid risk of injury. The reason that we use the burpee is because it's a whole body movement. It's sort of a complex movement. You have to move your body through a lot of different positions, from standing to prone to pressing to back to jumping. And so you get a bit of strength endurance to it, but a huge cardiovascular demand. So start the burpee from a standing position with your arms at your sides. And the first position you're going to hit is a solid plank on the ground. Your body should be straight like a board. You should be pushing away on the floor to activate your shoulders, then drop in to a complete push-up. Chest touches the floor, hips don't touch the floor, all the way back to full extension. Bring your feet forward and then reset into a squat position. From there, jump six inches at least in the air for the minimum jump, full extension on top, and clap for joy. So the burpee is a great whole body movement and you will get out of it exactly what you put into it. So here's what five good ones uh, look like all strung together. Pull-up is the only movement that requires some kind of apparatus, and it's the only sort of pulling motion that we can do with body weight. The pull-up is sort of a fine measure of upper body strength. It's important to integrate pulling movement into all of these other movements that we've uh, discussed. For that, we're gonna use the pull-up, and the important thing here is full range of motion. So you address the bar, hands roughly shoulder width apart, palms facing away is going to be the standard, and pull from the, from the bottom all the way until your head is completely over the bar or chest touching the bar. The bottom position is gonna be arms fully extended. So elbows are locked out, but the shoulders are activated to protect the musculature or to protect the shoulder joint. So the difference there is fully extended, hanging on connective tissue, and shoulders activated to protect the joint all the way up, all the way back down. You can switch your grip up to, with palms facing if the palms away grip is a little too difficult. This is probably the one where full range of motion is the most important, but also the most difficult to achieve. So pull-ups are not just for the boys. Women can do them as well and should. Um, if, you're, if you're smaller and you can't reach the bar and you really have to jump for it, you can step up on a box, 
to adjust your grip on the bar. If the, if the palms away grip is a little bit too hard, you can transfer the load to a bit stronger muscles by using a palms in grip. But again, range of motion is going to be key. Head all the way over the, the top of the bar and all the way back down into that fully extended position. You can use the box to step off and rest. It just puts you in a more powerful position to initiate the pull-up rather than like jumping and grasping for it, although that can be useful as well. If you're unable to do a full range pull-up on your own, there are some baby steps you can take. One of them actually uses a box here, and what I'll typically have people do is address, you know, get a box that's high enough, address the bar, jump into the top position so your head's fully over the bar, lower yourself down under your own power nice and slow, you recover position on the box, jump again, lower yourself down slowly, and in this lowering motion, you're actually building a lot of strength, and eventually, you'll need less and less power from the jump, and you'll graduate to a complete pull-up on your own. The deck squat looks a lot more challenging than it is. Uh, I mean, to go from lying down to squatting to standing and then back to lying down. Typically, when we add weight to a movement, it makes it more difficult. But with the deck squat, the weight actually makes it easier because the harder you throw it, the more that brings you into the squat position. The deck squat is another great whole body movement. To start, you'll be in a lying down position face up with your arms extended overhead and your feet extended in front. You can hold a weight, it can be a kettlebell, it can be a dumbbell, should be fairly light, it could be a medicine ball as well. Um, and, and to initiate the movement, you're gonna throw that weight forward to help drag you forward while collapsing your, your feet back towards your hips at the same time. You're gonna end up with a rounded back position, so pause at the bottom here, straighten up your spine to a neutral position, so proper squat form, and stand all the way up. Once your knees are fully extended, lower back down, in this uh, goblet squat movement, and then roll back out to full extension. So for the deck squat, the weight is actually helpful uh, because it works as a counterbalance to drag your body forward with momentum, but you can also try it without a weight. So the starting position is exactly the same, lying down, face up, with your arms extended overhead, feet extended. You're gonna make an explosive throw of your arms forward, kick yourself in the uh, buttocks with your feet, and when you arrive in this position, straighten out your spine for proper squat form, stand up, and all the way back down. Using the movements you've seen here as a framework, you can create a challenge for yourself and then try it on your own. Make sure you have a training partner with you or be very careful to execute proper form so that you do it safely and have a positive outcome. During these episodes, we've showed you some basic movements and discussed some pretty basic concepts. We've also showed some more advanced challenges and discussed how you can design your own. Something I'd like to make clear in this episode is that the physical work is not enough. If you're not paying attention to your diet and to your recovery, you're only doing part of the work, and that gym work cannot possibly outweigh all of your other behavior. No amount of hard work that you do in the gym can balance out bad dietary decisions. No amount of hard work that you do can counteract the fact that you don't get enough sleep. All of these things work in conjunction with one another, and you spend more time eating than you do training. So you ought to spend a lot more time thinking about dietary behavior than how much exercise you get in the gym. And you spend a lot more time sleeping than you do eating. So you might want to pay attention to the restorative value of sleep before you start focusing on little tweaks in your diet. There's an enormous difference between myself and my dietary sort of rules that I follow and the person who's one of the top 5% of performers in the world, whether that's athletically or someone on screen trying to achieve a physical aesthetic. If it's complicated, you're probably not gonna do it. I like the rules to be really simple because if they're simple and easy to follow, then we'll actually do them. I think one of the most important dietary concepts is to eat for an objective, you know, to eat for a reason. I need to lose 10 pounds because I want to do 25 consecutive pull-ups. That's my objective. I'm going to go at that via diet as opposed to via training. 10 pounds overweight, that's where I am now. I want to lose 10 pounds, that's my objective. Lay off the unconscious eating. Schedule my meals, perhaps. Maybe I need to start counting calories 
so that I know that an egg has 70. I know that an avocado has 350. A medium-sized banana has 70. If I know these things and it becomes automatic in my head eventually, yeah, I gotta learn. It's like going to school. For three months or six months, I have to pay attention, but then I own it, it's automatic, and I can change my behavior. A few of the most important things when it comes to diet are rules that I can give to people that are easy to follow is the closer to nature, the better. If it wasn't a food 100 years ago, it's not food today. So if some guy invented it in a lab, don't eat it. Pretty simple. The more packaging it has, the further away from nature it is, probably. Another thing I like to tell people, especially if they're in a weight loss thing, I say no white at night. And that just means, you know, no bread, no pasta, no rice, no potatoes. Things that are white. Yes, cauliflower is white and you can eat it. Egg whites are white and you can have that. Quit drinking beer. You take that out, all of a sudden you take out all these calories that are sugar type calories, main lines straight into your bloodstream. You know, the presence of alcohol in the liver uh, and, and in your system prevents a lot of good things from happening. Let's not overload with carbohydrate at night. Let's fuel our day with carbohydrate by having that in the morning instead. Because at night, that's, you know, I want to give myself a lot of protein at night so that during my hours of sleep, I give my body the resources to regenerate from the work I hopefully did during the day. 10 hours of sleep a night, over four liters of water a day. Do workouts in the gym that are actually recovery workouts, which might be 30 minutes of walking on a treadmill. It might be 30 minutes of being on a rowing machine or going for a swim, as opposed to the days when you work truly hard. Most people don't go hard enough on their hard days and they go too hard on the days that are supposed to be easy. So if you start managing the intensity of those days where you know, Monday is hard because I took Sunday off, Tuesday would be a little bit easier so I can go hard again Wednesday, that's an intelligent way to manage your work rest cycle. In order to cause change, you're gonna have to figure out what you're doing right now. So it'll be beneficial if during the next one or two weeks, you write down everything that you eat and then look at the end of the week and see where you might improve. So in these episodes, we've showed you some basic concepts and some very basic movements. And we've demonstrated some advanced challenges and talked about how you can design your own. We've also talked about the importance of diet and paying attention to recovery as well in order to complement the exercise that you're doing. So from here on out, I want you to do some of these challenges. Pay attention to your diet, pay attention to sleep, manage your stress. And if you do that and you do it consistently, then 30 days from now, 60 days from now, the physical opportunity that you have to do more and, and harder things is gonna expand exponentially and you'll be healthier as well.